there was always this line that we would say that was always meant as a joke. But now that I'm on this side, I want to say this to you sincerely. We're with the government, and we're here to help. So uh, <laughs> you can count on the state of Tennessee to be here to help you. So the most important thing I was, always, I was supposed to do is introduce our next guest. And for anybody that's uh, followed Eventbrite, you probably know Julia Hart's story. It's an amazing story. She co-founded this company in 2006 with her husband in California. They have now over a billion dollar valuation. They've got over 500 employees, also in seven countries. Um, and all my numbers, by the way, I'll, I'll uh, condition because I, this was like six months ago in the, in the press release that I got. The, um, I was just talking to her backstage and I want to make sure that my number that I had was correct in Nashville, that they had 40 employees. And she said, no, no, we're up to 100 and looking to expand. So uh, they're growing like wildfire. They're just an exciting company. And she's, I've seen several of her videos. She's a dynamic speaker. I'm excited to introduce to you uh, Julia Hartz. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm thrilled to be here today. Uh, I just spent the most fun, honestly, 24 hours with our team here in Nashville. Uh, Randy's right, we have 100 Nash Brights, we like to call ourselves, uh, and uh, just an incredible team here. The hospitality has been amazing, um, the talent is incredible. And we are looking um, to expand here in Nashville and double down our investments. So we've been open for one year. Um, but today I want to talk to you about what moves us as a company of 500. Uh, it's really around this idea of live experiences and the power to gather like we are today. And I know that it's atypical to start, or actually it's a bad idea, to start a talk with a video, but I was hoping that you all would humor me for just a second. And imagine you're running your first obstacle race. You take a deep breath and head up the hill towards smoke and dirt. All of a sudden, you're low crawling under barbed wire that's electrically shocking you, and you're feeling the mud between your fingertips. When all of a sudden, hold on, it's so, wait, is someone eating chips? You actually don't feel the mud between your fingertips and you don't actually feel the electrical shocks because you're watching this experience from the comfort of your own home. I think at Eventbrite we always wonder, is technology going to replace the live experience as the advent of Oculus Rift and other great virtual reality technology makes it our way and really changes the landscape of entertainment, will that actually change our propensity to gather? I'm sure you won't be surprised uh, that I say no way. Um, at Eventbrite, our uh, roots are in the idea that gathering is something that's innate to human beings, and that is something that is driven by technology. And gathering around great live experiences is not going to go away. And why? So I think a universal feeling that we all share is the idea that live experiences create indelible memories. For me, that's at the War Memorial Opera House in San Francisco, where every year as a little kid, my parents would drive me the 90 minutes from our little sleepy beach town in Santa Cruz up to uh, this fa fabulous venue where we'd see amazing performances. And one memory I will never forget is when I was 13, for my birthday, I got to bring a couple girlfriends up to um, see the Phantom of the Opera. And I spent my hard-earned chore money on buying one of those plastic sort of chintzy uh, phantom masks, and I got to go backstage and the phantom signed my, my mask, which I still actually have today. So those, those memories are things that, although we consume terabytes of information every day through online media, we actually don't forget those memories, right? So we hold them dear, and that's one reason why live experiences are so important to, to us as individuals. But we also can point to history and see how live experiences have changed big groups of people. So in 1955, Allen Ginsberg, uh, a, a famous poet, read his first poem, Howl, to a group of 200 people in Golden Gate Park, which actually sparked a huge literary movement. In 1985, a few more people, a million to be exact, gathered uh, for the first Rock in Rio concert to not only enjoy amazing music and be together, but celebrate independence as several countries' dictatorships had fallen that year or present day, where tens of thousands of people gather in arenas all over this country to watch indiv individuals play computer games. 
Uh, it's called eSports, and it's a huge phenomenon we're seeing on Eventbrite. So how, how is this possible for so many different types of people uh, through the ages to be connected through live experiences? What compels us to gather? It's really, an, like I mentioned, an innate human need of belonging. So when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we see that connectedness and belonging are one of those needs that we have to fulfill to thrive as humans. And live experiences such as today do just that. And I think that as we look forward, as we uh, start to think about what are the trends that, that emerge through this time when we are seriously living in an incredible time with technology, I think that one of the really interesting notions is that experientialism, which really is a made-up word, uh, is uh, going to start overtaking materialism. And why is that? Um, you know, I think that for us, it's, it's about three macro trends. And we dug into some research. We partnered with Harris Research, as well as gathered some anecdotes. And I want to share those with you guys today uh, in hopes that these, that these trends will inspire you to think about the experience you're giving your customers and how you're connecting with others. So the first macro trend is that consumers' attitudes are fundamentally changing. It used to be about what we owned that identified us. And now it's about what we do. One reason behind that is the idea that we've sort of saturated materialism and that there's only so many things that we can buy that will actually that will, uh, be in pursuit of bringing us happiness. But ultimately, material goods suffer from something called hedonic adaptation, which is a mouthful. I am practiced. Uh, and this idea of hedonic adaptation is that material goods sort of bring us happiness. There's this like, initial fulfillment when you buy something, and then that fulfillment starts to erode over time. And the value of that good or the happiness that it brings you eventually sort of decelerates. But with experiences, a great experience can last a lifetime. It actually even gets better in the retelling of that experience. I'm sure some of you have those memories that are so much grander now uh, than they were 20 years ago. And those experience, experiences live with us. And the interesting part about experiences is there's really three stages. There's the anticipation, the discovering of the event, or being invited to an event, or buying the ticket. And then there's the palpable energy that you feel being at the event, being with others like today. And then there's that memory, in some instances irreplaceable, that starts to build that value and continue that value over time. And so at Eventbrite, we think about who are consumers now versus then? Why are they driven to be gathering um, at live experiences? What drives them to spend their money on live experiences? As I mentioned, we partnered with Harris Research last fall to look at consumer attitudes towards experiences and material goods. One of the interesting things that we uh, picked up in our research is that millennials, who are going to now be the largest living generation come 2020, and command the most amount of spending. Currently, they command 1.3 trillion. Millennials are the experiences generation. They're really dri the, one of the driving forces behind consumers deciding to uh, spend more money on events. In fact, a majority of the millennials that we surveyed said that they want to and plan to spend more money on experiences in the next 12 months. And when we think about you know, how we're driving this type of gathering, we think about what that means. What do millennials want? One example that I wanted to share with you, or anecdote rather, that we see in our uh, data as well as what's going on um, on our platform is this idea of pop-up dining. So millennials love pop-up dining. And pop-up dining is really just a unique one-time event to eat great food and connect with the person who makes that food. And whether it's at a unique venue, or with an amazing chef, or with interesting people, the millennials that we surveyed said half would be willing to pay more for the same exact menu if we're in a pop-up dining setting than just a run-of-the-mill restaurant. So it's really interesting, I think, um, you know, that, that we're searching for something special. We're searching to connect with others in a different way. So consumer attitudes are fundamentally changing, but what about technology? I started this talk showing you, you know, something that I actually just got to experience last week, which is 
amazing virtual reality, bringing us into experiences from the comfort of our own home. So why would technology actually be a driver of live experiences instead of a disruptor? Well, one reason is the idea of social capital. Um, social capital is the social derived from sharing something online. And what we're finding is that uh, experienced goers are sharing in droves their experiences online. Um, one funny anecdote from uh, somebody I greatly admire, Taylor Swift, and I'm not afraid to say it. Uh, she, she said that since the, uh, the wise Taylor Swift said, uh, from the uh, advent of the smartphone, she hasn't been asked for autographs. She only gets asked to take selfies. When you think about social capital, it's sort of the ultimate uh, social capital for the super fan. The selfie certainly exists as uh, a marker of time. And in fact, in our research, we saw that one in three people said that they share online on Twitter, LinkedIn, other share, Instagram, other sharing platforms during the event, and about a quarter of them reported sharing about their experience after, event, after the event. And that's really driving this flywheel of growth, because as we're sharing online, we're building our own identity and our capital, but we're also marketing the experience to our social graph. Another anecdote that we're seeing in a sort of emerging subtrend on Eventbrite is the idea um, of taking selfies at museums. So this is really driving the um, sort of extension of the performing and visual arts scene, especially with millennials. And a champion of the arts, Mar Dixon, uh, basically just uh, declared January 31st the museum selfie day to really start to broadcast um, museums and the, and the great art that exists in museums. And what happened was amazing. People took to social media to post their selfies with great works of art. Some were really cute, some were artsy, some were really clever. But all in all, it really started to extend this idea that you can discover great art online and then take that uh, inspiration offline. And so when we asked uh, millennials how they discover uh, great art, about half of them said that they discover great art from social media, which again is this flywheel of growth and really growing that space. So we talked about uh, consumer attitudes and we talked about technology driving live experiences through this notion of social capital. And the third thing I wanted to talk about is something that um, it's a bit of a sensitive topic. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna warn you, but I think we could all band together. You guys are gonna be together for two days um, and talk about this idea of FOMO. So the fear of missing out is uh, the clinical term for that twinge of anxiety you feel when you see something that your friends are doing or family is doing online and you're not there. And so through technology, we are covering a lot of ground in being able to expose our lives to one another and share where we are. And of course, we only share the very best of our lives. Uh, and so this idea that uh, consumers have a fear of missing out is real. In fact, half of our survey respondents were brave enough to admit that they have FOMO. We can, we can venture it's actually much greater than that. But um, we saw that trend in our data, and it's actually something uh, really true that's driving this, this desire to get out and do. Uh, my final sort of example for you is rooted in a famous music festival, Coachella. Not as famous as Bonnaroo, but it's getting there. Um, and Coachella, you know, is one of the premier festivals on the West Coast. And so uh, the, you know, ability for Coachella to attract attendees um, is something that they don't have much trouble with. But in 2011, they decided to do something pretty risky. They decided to start live streaming the festival in real time with high def cameras for free and offer it through YouTube. And the festival industry went nuts because they thought this was going to cannibalize ticket sales. And you see the effect through the chart. Uh, the, their ticket sales soared after they were able to show what the experience that was to everybody who was missing out in the live experience. Uh, who is watching it online. And I think that this exemplifies the idea that the fear of missing out is something that really does help people uh, take that extra step to buy a ticket and attend an event. So these are the three macro trends that we've discovered that it are driving our desire to gather more than ever. I'm sure we're going to be finding uh, more macro trends as we continue our research and interesting uh, collection of our data. 
And I think that what I wanted to leave you with today is, you know, as you have this experience today, as you spend the next two days together, think about how you can own your customer's experience. Uh, think about how you could create a connection with your customers that, you know, maybe isn't a live event, but think about what they want and how they want to connect with others. We're seeing some really interesting uh, success that customers are having uh, that are, are really owning that end-to-end -end experience. Uh, one of the speakers today is a company that, from a company that we admire, who we think are doing a great job in owning their customer experience, uh, Warby Parker. And uh, I think that you'll get a lot of really great uh, inspiration about the idea of making your customer's experience the very best it could be. And also, congratulations to you guys for taking the step and connecting with others today at this, at this event. Thank you for having me, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.